Hello, hello, hello. I have missed you guys. All the way since April, I had to wait and wait until we could do this again. But tonight is the beginning of Sense of Place season 14. Ooh, I see some bum years up there. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sarah Fox. I'm the host and curator of Sense of Place, and I'm so excited to have you here to help me launch the season. Um, tonight, we are going to be hearing about the largest fish in North America that lives right here in our backyard. I'm sure some of you guys have seen it in person, and if you haven't seen it in person before tonight, you will right there later. Um, the way tonight will work is after the presentation, we'll have a chance for some Q&A and also a chance for the best show and tell you've ever seen. Um, and, but first, I need to tell you what has happened since I saw you last because not one, but two of my dreams have come true. <laughs> thank you. You guys are partly to thank for it, so stay tuned. So the first dream was, when I took over Sense of Place, now about five years ago, I knew that this was a program that ran once a month, October through April, because boy, in those dark, dreary months, we need a reason to come together and be curious and drink wine and laugh and learn. And that was why I took the job. But the other thing that I wanted to do almost immediately was figure out something we could do in all those other months. And what I really wanted to do was have field trips and workshops for big kids like me, and sometimes big little kids too. And just this fall, we launched a Sense of Place workshop and field trip with the one and only incredible Michael Bug, which I'm sure some of you know. He's a Sense of Place alum from season 11, I think. He is a renowned mycologist who just happens to live here in the gorge, and he took out a group of 20 to go hunt and forage for mushrooms, and then we came back and we learned how to cook them, and the event sold out so quickly that he said, do you want me to do another? And I said, of course I want you to do another. And so the next week, we went out again with a whole nother group of people, and we hunted and foraged for mushrooms, and we came back and we learned about them and cooked and had an amazing time. And it was so successful that I know they will not be the last. I think this is the beginning of Sense of Place version 3.0, and that you will all at some point be able to join me on a field trip or a workshop, getting out into this place with incredible people who have unique knowledge of it. Um, and I will just say, based on how quickly these sold out, if you are not on our newsletter or you don't follow us on social media or all any of that stuff, Think about it because I feel really bad when people can't get something that they want because they didn't know it was happening. So it's my quick plug for those two things. So the reason that this first dream could come true, besides all of you and our incredible sponsors, is that Sense of Place is a program of Mount Adams Institute, which means we do not have to go it alone. We are part of an incredible local nonprofit that is doing work on a national level to help people connect to the outdoors and this place in so many different ways. Sometimes it happens in the theater, sometimes it happens out and about. Um, but if you don't know about Mount Adams Institute, I encourage you to check them out because we exist because of them. Which brings me to my second dream, which is this summer, we partnered with Columbia Center for the Arts, where we are tonight, to apply for a grant to the Oregon Cultural Trust to help support our live stream. Did you guys know that there are people watching right now who are not in this theater? Okay, you guys wanna help me say hi to them? On the count of three, we're gonna say hi everyone at home and, and I'm gonna wave at the camera and if you can reach it, you can do it too. Okay, one, two, three. Hi everyone at home! All right, if you grew up in Oregon, you remember Ramblin' Rod would do like the smile competition? <laughs> I'll see if I can figure that out next time. <laughs> So we are essentially once a month producing a like hour long, hour and a half long live TV show. And I can tell you, I have worked in TV and the budget and the team that we're working with is much less than what you usually need to produce a live TV show. <laughs> Fortunately, we applied for this grant as a partner of CCA and Oregon Cultural Trust said, yes, we think what you're doing is worth it and we're gonna give you the money. 
which means this live stream that's so important to me, and I'll tell you why in a second, is going to continue. And it also means that these important people here <laughs> will hopefully have a slightly easier job. This is Etta, who you may have met out front, and Joe, who is currently up in our booth. They are part of the SOP team. They, are, they rely on me, really, for everything live stream. They look to me, as you can see from this respect they're giving me. They say, Sarah, how do we do this? Sarah, help us with the tech. And um, so without me, this wouldn't, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> these two are all the live stream. I hope this grant helps them. So my dream is hopefully their dream as well. Um, so those are my two big dreams. Um, this is part of the awesome team. Um, the reason the live stream and these workshops and everything that we're doing here at Sense of Place is so important to me um, is something that I think a lot about every time a season starts, which is where Sense of Place began. And that was 13 years ago with our founder, Amanda Lawrence, who I'm sure some of you know and have been coming to Sense of Place since she was doing it. Um, and what Amanda said was, boy, we need a way to come together outside of those times of conflict outside of those times of crisis, a way to come together and be curious and learn together and feel a connection in a way. And that was the beginning of the idea of sense of place, is that regardless your background, your belief, what you did today, what you're gonna do tonight, for an hour, hour or a little bit more, we can come together here and say, the one thing we have in common is this place. And I will tell you, there is a part of me that thinks this place, and I think the gorge, but I also can expand that and say Oregon or Washington or the Northwest or this country or this world. And to me, that mission really resonated and still does. I think it's as true today as it ever was that we need moments where we get that time together to feel a shared sense of wonder. Because I really think that when we take the time to lead a little bit with curiosity, good things happen. So I hope that all of you get a little bit of that tonight with Donella. And if you do, I hope that you thank the incredible sponsors that we have. We have some that have been with us since year one, who put up with me every year, sort of haranguing them and giving them a shakedown to give me more money again, <laughs> who put up with my emails and my phone calls. And this season, we have a ton of new sponsors. And I was just noticing how many are, we have individual sponsors, we have um, nonprofit sponsors, we have company sponsors, and so it's really a good representation of the entire gorge, and I'm really proud of that. Um, so, I think that's all I need to get out of the way before I introduce you to our guest tonight. So, Donella Miller, we have speakers come to us in two ways, typically. We put out an RFP and people submit proposals, but I also do a lot of sleuthing and asking around because that's how you find the diamonds out there. And so I asked around, I'd been wanting to learn about sturgeon for a while, and I asked around, I said, who should I talk to? And Donella's name came up. Someone wrote to me, she is, all caps, THE STURGEON LADY. And I was like, okay. So I reached out to her many months ago and said, will you come join us? And she was fantastic, and she said she would. And then I said, is there any chance that you would bring Sturgeon with you? And she said she would. So. Um, and so I'm very excited to have Donella here tonight. Donella is currently the fishery, or, and new, this is a relatively new job for her, the fishery science manager at the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, CRITFIC is how you guys might have heard of it. Really important group. We're going to learn some about them tonight. We're going to learn more about them in future season, seasons. Critfic, put that in your head. Um, prior to Critfic, she worked with Yakima Nation Fisheries. She was the program manager at the White Sturgeon Project, which did some groundbreaking work in white sturgeon work here in the Columbia River Basin. You're going to hear more about that tonight. So she's had nearly three decades of experience in managing natural resources here in the basin. Um, from what we would sort of call a Western science perspective, that she is formally educated in that. But I think what's really great about Donella is that she also brings a lifetime of, of experience from the cultural perspective of white sturgeon, in addition to a lot of the natural resources here. Um, Donella is an enrolled member of 
the Yakima Nation, I'm sorry, I really want to say the whole tribe, whole name. She's an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of Yakima Nation. She's also descended of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation and Blackfeet Nation. For those of you who this may be new to you or some of you kids, you guys will learn before I did, these are sovereign nations, so independent nations within this area. And I think that's a really unique and um, interesting piece of our local life here. Um, so among the many things we're gonna learn about from Danella tonight, I think one of the most important, and I hope we all walk away with this, is that our natural world is much more intertwined with our cultural world than we sometimes remember. And so I hope that you will help me in welcoming Donella Miller to Sense of Place season 14. Thank you. should be. Can you guys, can you hear me okay? Okay. Just making sure, because I can't hear myself. <laughs> you good with her? Is she close enough? As close as you can get. Yeah, as close as you can get. I know mics are kind of weird. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here tonight. And um, I won't do a formal prayer, but I'd like to just open with thanking all of you for being here and also um, giving thanks to Tamanglafla, our creator, for bringing us all together here today. And also sharing a little bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, where we're at today um, is the treaty ter territories the, of the Warm Springs tribe of Oregon. And actually just across the river is the Yakima Treaty Territories, where I'm from. And um, that that's, you know, like we were all moved to our reservations, but we still hold our, our ties to our ancestral lands and the, the land here on the Inchuana, the, the Columbia River. And um, I know you, a lot of you probably see tribal members out fishing and, and some, a few that still live in the community. And, um, you know, even though I, I grew up on the reservation, but we still have that strong tie to, to the Columbia River. And actually, um, my part of my family, this um, this necklace that I'm wearing, my grandfather, his Indian name, his band was the uh, Klinkwa, and they're actually just from their their lands were just across the river here, in between the Klickitat and the the White Salmon. So really, this is just coming home for me. So I'm really glad to be here today and thinking about when I was asked to do this, um, I think they had me at the title, you know, sense of place. It's with each of you um, acknowledging and learning more about where, where we're at today. And it really says a lot about all of you that you take the time and care and the interest to know more about this land and um, and I think, you know, like uh, Sarah mentioned, um, you know, I'm trained in Western science. I'm a fisheries biologist. Um, I got my education at the University of Idaho, but I also grew up in a traditional family. And, um, you know, we learned cultural values. And I think those that's what was instilled to me by my grandparents, my ancestors, and so, this isn't just a job to me. It's, I feel like I'm doing what I was meant to do and carry on the work of my ancestors because they started these things, you know, far before I was born. And um, just ensuring that, that these things remain for our future generations and um, I think is m what's most important. And then seeing, you know, all of you here today and knowing that you all care and you know the the cultural perspective and um, understanding that you're a part of something you're a part of nature and the environment and everything and not superior to it i think is the one of the main perspectives that that 
you know, is the root of our tribal culture. And, you know, we're salmon people, but um, we hold all of our natural resources sacred. And so that's why we have a sturgeon project and the work that we do isn't just salmon centric, it's all species and everything has a place and a purpose. And like each of you, you know, that, that's what brought you here today. Your purpose is to, you know, learn more and share the knowledge with others. And um, so that's, I just wanted to take a minute to kind of kick it off in, in that manner and kind of share that background perspective and, and also to thank all of you. So as Sarah mentioned, um, um, I just started in March. I'm the fishery science manager for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. And previously I worked for the Yakima Nation for 29 and a half years. And I started when I was 18 and I started as a fisheries technician. I was a fish culturist. Uh, I did bookkeeping work while I was in college. And um, so I kind of got to see all aspects. And when I was finishing college, um, we were just starting this, uh, they were working on the Bonneville Fish Accords. That's the accord, uh, the agreement was a 10 year agreement between the tribes and Washington to, um, with the Bonneville Power Administration that would give us secured funding for that 10 year period to, it, it was like, you agree not to sue us and we'll fund your projects. Assured, assurance for the next 10 years. So, um, so that, that's, that, that's what allowed us to do this um, you know, Sturgeon Project, and uh, if people were here last year when we had Ralph Lampman, Lampman um, and that's how we started the Lamprey Project because we had that accord agreement to, to be able to take on this new work and do uh, work outside of the, in, you know, ESA listed species because that's what's mostly most important to the tribes is rebuilding populations to healthy and sustainable levels and not just managing them to the lowest possible bar of the Endangered Species Act. We're not just holding them on the, doing as little as possible and holding them on the brink of extinction. We're working to rebuild to that healthy and sustainable <laughs> level again. And um, so that, that, that was the beginnings of the Sturgeon Project. And um, I did that for 13 years. And then um, I got promoted to the program manager position and um, the Yakima Nation actually has one of the largest uh, tribal fisheries programs in the nation. There's um, about 240 full-time regular employees. And um, so I had the pleasure of overseeing that, <laughs> that program for a couple of years. And then that's what led to the opportunity to transition to CRIPFIC. And it was a really tough decision, but what it came down to, so I'm all still still able to do all of that great work, but just at a at a broader scale, um, working with all four um, Columbia River Treaty tribes. So I'll kind of um, and um, the Sturgeon Project is actually a joint project between the Yakima Nation and the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. So that's why I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, a background on, on CRIPFIC if you're not aware. And I'll kind of speed through this because I know you, you want to hear about the fish. <laughs> and as I mentioned, there's um, four tribes that make up the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. And CRIPFIC is a, a technical service to each of these four tribes. Each of the four tribes have their own treaty territories, which encompass about one fourth of the Columbia River Basin, but it's nearly 50% of the salmon bearing streams that are currently in the basin. And so we get we work with all four, four tribes to provide technical support because you see the the expansive scope um, that that each of them work in. And well, I skipped ahead of myself. There's that information here, but um, and. You know, if you're not aware, the, the tribes um, signed treaties in 1855, the Treaty of Walla Walla. Um, and um, CRIPFIC was established in 1977. And as I mentioned, it um, provides a number of services for each of the tribes. And, you know, uh, fishery science, that's kind of the, 
the meat, the, the backbone of um, the research. And it's, and it's funny, like the deeper you get into fisheries management, it's a lot like anything else and even law. Like, you know, when you're in a court of law, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And it's the same thing with resource management. That's why we do the research and the science to, to justify and to uh, tease out what the needs are and how to address those. And that, that's what we, we work towards. And um, our director, she's also new to the program, uh, or not new to her position, uh, Asia Dakota. She's also a Yakima tribal member. And um, so she's the executive director for the past, um, going on two years. Um, and um, her, the former um, director actually took an appointment with the Biden administration, uh, Jamie Pinkham. He's a Nez Perce tribal member. And he's actually the, the number two for the US Army Corps Division of Civil Works. So he's works out of the Pentagon. He's the the second rank, ranking official that works directly under Mike Connor. So um, you know the work that we do is really recognized at a, real, a high level, um, not just in the region but on a national level. Um, and then also my position, um, the it was also a Nez Perce tribal member, Zach Penny, and he also took an appointment with the Biden administration, working for um, NOAA. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA Fisheries in in DC as well as a, a senior policy advisor. So, um, like I said, just high high quality work that's recognized at a national level. And um, I, I don't know if many of you are aware, but there's a, actually an enforcement office right here in Hood River, just on the west side of town there, and they they patrol fisheries enforcement for the main stem. And um, this just gives an overview of all the services that CRIPFIC provides. Okay, so we'll move on to the, the fun stuff now. <laughs> okay, the, those numbers don't mean much. This is the Bonneville project number, but it just shows, like I mentioned, we started this project in 2008, which which also kind of says something there, like we've had salmon hatcheries, um, you know, for over a hundred years, but um, sturgeon, ha sturgeon culture is really in its infancy in the United States because they've always taken a back seat to um, salmon conservation. Um, um, so, and I think it, it's really, if it wasn't for the um, um, the long-lived, um, the long life of the sturgeon that they could be extinct now because they could live in excess of 150 years um, and grow to 100, you know, 15 feet long. Uh, we've actually catch, captured fish that that large in our broodstock collection, and so um, yeah, there there's fish swimming out in, in this river right in front of us that that predate the dams. So this just talks about our current projects. As I mentioned, we're working with the Bonneville Power Administration to put fish back into the, the main stem Columbia in this area. We're actually gonna be starting in the um, John Day Reservoir. And um, this, this reservoir here, the Bonneville Reservoir, is actually the, the most pr productive of um, reservoirs and then you know, just logically looking as you move upstream, the populations get smaller. Um, and just because there's no more passage for them anymore because the, um, they don't use the fish, fish ladders like salmon do. They, they're managed more as a resident species. There's some downstream migration as juveniles, but as adults, the fish that are in these reservoirs, they, they, don't, they don't leave the reservoir. And so the, the Yakima Nation um, constructed a sturgeon hatchery um, on the reservation. And it may seem funny, like, why do we have a sturgeon hatchery in the middle of the desert <laughs> in Toppenish? But it's actually um, pretty central in the area that we work on because we're also working with the Mid-Columbia Public Utility Districts, Grant County, Chelan County, and Douglas County. 
And so we've worked with them over the years to um, fulfill their mitigation responsibilities uh, for their operator's license for the dam. So we've put fish um, uh, from Priest Rapids Reservoir all the way up to uh, Chief Joseph Dam. And um, it's actually kind of funny that, um, you know, doing that work for the PUDs is um, we're kind of record speed for a hatchery facility because a lot of times um, uh, starting hatchery programs takes decades, <laughs> it seems, because uh, with that Bonneville process, we're still working through the master plan process that we started in 2008. And this year, we actually um, broke ground this spring um, in drilling the first well. So <laughs> it, it's been uh, a number of years just going through that process and all of the red tape and, um, and everything. Whereas the tribe itself um, moved forward working with the PUDs to kickstart the, the program. And, um, and we've been putting fish in the river for the past 12 years. So, um, and it's a, a full hatchery program. We collect um, wild adults uh, from the river and we spawn them in the facility and, um, and then release those juveniles back into the river, into the various pools. And as you'll see in that picture on the bottom there, um, every fish that we put into the river receives a pit tag, like I'd say, like in the back of its neck, <laughs> how you'd had to describe it. And, and then we also remove some scoots on the side so that um, those fish could be tracked for monitoring and evaluation to look at survival and growth and, and those types of things. Um, and um, as I mentioned, it's, um, is centralized on the Acoma Reservation so that that we're able to, you know, we're putting fish in the mid-Columbia while also being able to collect brood. We've been uh, collecting brood. We kind of found the, the sweet spot right now, um, collecting just below McNary Dam. It's just the, the way the river is there um, makes uh, the brood accessible. And our goal is um, collecting eight females and eight to 12 males. And um, we do that so that we could, um, you know, we're conscious of uh, genetic contribution of the fish, fish that we're putting into the river because we don't, like, we could get more than enough eggs from just one female, but um, we're collecting um, multiple fish, uh, so you have a lot of genetic diversity. You're doing a factorial spawning matrix, and then that creates a, a lot of half-sibling families. And um, we're only releasing X number of fish per family back into the river and doing that on an annual basis to rebuild the populations. And you'll see here, um, like, a, like I mentioned, these fish are, you know, really old. The, and this is when we were doing brood collection. And you can't, you can't tell um, a male from a female just by looking like how many mouse has a bow. It was just, yeah, sturgeon don't have that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and so you actually have to do a, a, a surgery on the fish. You make a small incision on their stomach and you look inside with the otoscope, how the doctor looks in your ear. And then you could, um, you could actually see their reproductive organs to know whether it's a female or a male. And then also if it has eggs or you know, you could kind of stage them on whether or not they're going to spawn this year because they spawn on a cycle of, you know, every three, uh, females spawn every three to five years, whereas males could spawn annually, but, you know, they don't always. And so when you're out there, it's kind of finding a needle in a haystack. So um, the one year we collected uh, brood um, just below the Dalles Dam, we handled 254 adult sturgeon in a two-week period and we found one ripe female. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that's the other thing too with sturgeon. Um, you know, their spawning habitat is really limited to the tail races of the dams because they're broadcast spawners. And so what they would do is go into those rapids and below the falls and things like that to, and uh, broadcast spawn their eggs and the water would disperse them. And, um, the, they get sticky when they contact the water, and so they would stick on the rocks, and that's where they'd incubate and hatch. 
So in this um, here, we're actually collecting eggs from this um, adult female, and they're all live spawn um, because, like I said, they're a repeat spawner. So um, and they once we get them in the hatchery, they they wouldn't release their eggs, so we have to inject them with an artificial hormone, and it's kind of the same the same type of hormone that they use in humans to induce labor as well, and so. When we're spawning them, it, it really is a, a waiting game. Um, we give the try to time the in injections so that they start drop releasing eggs um, during work hours. But <laughs> 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 but we've been in the in the tank spawning fish at one o'clock in the morning, so <laughs> or two. But um, we're got it dialed in pretty well now on how to time the injections. And it's the same thing with the males. We give that injection and. Um, they start flowing with milk, and we go and collect the milk from them as well. And as I mentioned, um, in our first years, um, in sturgeon culture is, I'd, I'd say, more of an art than it is a science because it was really difficult, for one, to find the fish and then also to, to get the timing down to um, be able to spawn them in the hatchery. And so we had to install these chillers, um, their heat pumps. They could heat water or chill the water. And because those first years, the by the time the females were ready to spawn, the, the males were already spent. So um, so now with these, we're able to chill the males to be able to ex extend their viability. And I mentioned here about the factorial spawning matrix, and that's just to, um, to um, maintain that genetic diversity of the fish that we're putting back into the river. And um, the sturgeon, they're, they're hatched in these um, incubation jars. And, I'd, you know, you can't tell context. The, the prototypes for these were like a two-liter pitcher of soda. <laughs> and so what the water flows on the bottom and it upwells. These are called upwelling jars. And the other thing that's so interesting about sturgeon is something that lives for so long, how small they start out and how fast they hatch. Because, you know, these 10 foot females and, you know, you've all heard of caviar and seen caviar. It's these small beads like the size of a BB, you know, and um, when they hatch, they're that tiny as well. And like with, um, with salmon, how they spawn and they overwinter and in the gravel and it takes them months to incubate and hatch. Well, these sturgeon spawn in the spring and they actually hatch out in about seven to 10 days, just depending on the water temperature. And so these, uh, these small larvae, they look like tadpoles. They have the little yolk sac. And then it's only another seven to 10 days before they've absorbed the, their yolk sac and they start feeding. So that that cycle is really um, accelerated and so we hold them in the hatchery for about 10 months and each of those uh, fish I mentioned they receive a pit tag so that we could track and monitor their growth and survival once they're released and um, as I said we only release X, X number a decided upon number per family and so they're all reared separately up until they're tagged and then they're grouped in tanks to um, according to their release location. And I skipped ahead of myself again. <laughs> and, um, for a few years, we tried a wild larval collection, and <laughs> we thought finding ripe adults in the river was a needle in a haystack. Well, try finding a, a one-inch fish at the bottom of the Columbia River. <laughs> and, um, we had these nets, which literally felt kind of ridiculous going out there. We have this big river and we have these three foot diameter nets that were sitting on the bottom of the, on the bottom and it funnels down into a bucket. And we did that for weeks, for several years. And we only caught about 250 larvae. So we <laughs> just check in the boxes like, okay, that's not a viable option <laughs> for, <laughs> for restocking. Um, because that's really where the gap in the life cycle is, is one reduced spawning habitat and limited survival for spawning. The only time that you see um, 
sizable natural production is on those really high water years, like flood years. And um, so then we'll see natural recruitment. You see those pulses in the, in the population. And so um, that's not really viable, you know, because, and especially with climate change, you know, the, those are few and far in between. And so that um, this hatchery production pr provides assurance that, that there's annual recruitment into the population. Um, and then, like with everything else, um, once you study things, you, you find out information and it's not always good or, or what you expected. And the genetics of sturgeon, they're such a unique animal. They're a prehistoric animal. They're over 200 million years old. They predate the dinosaurs and they're still around. And how humans are diploid, we have two sets of chromosomes. Well, sturgeon are actually octoploid. They have eight sets of chromosomes. And um, that's how they're unique. And one of the things that was detected once they started looking is that they were starting to see some 12-end 12, 12 fish coming out of the hatchery program. So, um, you know, they have 12 sets of chromosomes. And um, it, it took a few years to kind of figure it out. And um, they you know, possibly that's one of the ways that they evolved how they became 8N. But what's bad about this is these 12N fish would be um, viable to reproduce. And then they would, they would produce, you know, like contribute six, six sets of chromosomes and recombination. But the bottom line is two generations down, those, um, those offspring would be sterile. And so we didn't want to be, um, take, take the risk of, you know, introducing that. So the, every fish that's released from the hatchery, we take a blood sample during that tagging proce process, and then we're able to determine whether it's 8N or 12N. And so all of the 12N fish are removed and they're not released. And um, there's always a boogeyman out there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, we were able to address that and manage for it. And what we've seen over the years is, um, you know, we have only have a handful. Like, I think last year we released over 3,000 fish and we only found 12, 12-end 12 fish. So it wasn't a, as big of a, a threat as we originally thought. And um, so... So yeah, we're just kind of growing and evolving and continuing to um, work through the, the challenges. And the other thing is that first, that seeing those 12 in fish, they thought it was a, a product of the hatchery that maybe handling during the spawning process was, was causing it. And then when we were doing brood collection, we actually started collecting blood from the adults in the river. And we actually spawned a 12 in fish that a wild fish she was like over nine feet long and so there's no way she was a hatchery fish but she was a wild a wild fish that was 12 in and so it does occur in nature but at a really low occurrence and so we just didn't use those fish so as not to like further advance that and as i mentioned there the the future of the project is working with the Bonneville Power Administration to expand the program and start uh, putting fish into this section of the river, you know, known as uh, Zone 6, which is, um, the, and that's the harvest management unit, which is Bonneville to John Day Dam. And so we're starting in John Day, starting to, um, I'd say it's probably going to be about another two to three years because we just broke ground on that well and it takes a couple years for the environmental clearances and, and then the actual construction. And so it's a really slow process, but we'll get there. <laughs> I never imagined I wouldn't, I'd, I would have handed it off to somebody else, you know, being younger in my career. I, and then I started looking like, Jesus, am, am I even gonna be alive? <laughs> and it's also funny with uh, working with sturgeon um, being so long lived um, they don't seem in a hurry to do anything <laughs> even with uh, like salmon or anadromous they have a really rapid life cycle they go to the ocean come back spawn and they die 
well, sturgeon were also an an anadromous, but um, they're also kind of considered semi-anadromous because um, they didn't always go to the ocean. You know, they followed the food and they'd just move around in the system and um, follow their food sources and, you know, if they didn't spawn one year, they spawn the next year, and so they're just really casual. I guess it, <laughs> if you're gonna live for a, to be 150, <laughs> it's not a big deal. And it's also funny too. I've always been really impatient. That's why I said it's funny how the most impatient person in the world ends up uh, working with the most longest-lived species. <laughs> But um, that, that's kind of just running through this at a, at a high level. And I, in hindsight, I wish I would have prepared more for a general audience and included some other cool pictures. So if you get a chance to look at the social media page, I had sent Sarah some pictures of you know, us on the river um, with one of the biggest fish that I've ever caught, the biggest fish that we caught at work, which was over 12 feet long. And there's five of us all side by side with that fish. It was huge. But actually, my favorite picture is one that I took in the hatchery of a sturgeon that was about three weeks old. And it's a close-up, and I have it on my finger. And uh, it looks like a big sturgeon, but it's tiny. <laughs> Thank you, Donella. That was an excellent presentation. Since sturgeon are bottom feeders, are there certain pollutants that are a real problem to them that get down to the bottom of the river? And, and if so, what is being done about it? Yeah, and that, that's one of the things. They are um, bottom feeders, but what people also don't know is that they're as much a predator as anything else. Um, they, And I guess I should have started with that with better pictures, but their mouth is kind of, would be like where their neck is. And um, they don't have any teeth in that their mouth protrudes out. And the preferred prey is actually salmonids. They are a predator. They feed on salmon, which we also work to restore, but they're a natural predator. <laughs> and so, um, but the other, the other foods, uh, is like clams, which is in that sediment, and that is a concern um, for contaminants in the Columbia. And there's certain areas, and 
um, it's unfortunate to to say, but there are um, like um, health guidelines to um, limit portions, and even certain areas where um, they th it's a do not eat from fish from this area, and that's uh, Bradford Island, just you know a part of the Bonneville Dam structure because there's a PCB contamination there. And then there's also, you know, EPA guidelines for contaminants. And, you know, it's like four servings um, per month and um, things like that. And that, that's one thing that the tribe has really worked hard on. Another component of our work is uh, water quality and, you know, things like temperature, but also contaminants. And, um, you know, our, you know, the, to us, the solution isn't limit intake because you know that's our natural food our our the solution we want is to fix the problem and clean up the river so that that is a part of uh, of our work as well if you were to sum up you know to start sort of the offer on the board and then Mary and Charles and Lori the the pieces or the reasons that sturgeon are struggling like what's our what's our list water temperature predators contaminant like why are they not doing as well as they should be doing? Yeah, and I often refer to that um, as death by a thousand cuts because it isn't just one thing, one single thing that's the issue or one single thing that's the solution. It's gonna take a suite of a comprehensive solution to restore the, the natural ecosystem. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, that's that's what our overarching goal of, of the, the tribes and Kritvik is, is that comprehensive um, solutions. But, um, you know, if you do have to make a list, it's uh, um, the altered, altered ecosystem, and dams do play a big part in that, where um, it's changed, you know, it's not a free-flowing river anymore, there's a, a lack of, of spawning habitat, but it's also altered the, um, the runoff, the high water, you know, in the spring that they would naturally spawn in, and it's also elevated temperatures. So a lot of times, like naturally, they would spawn from May to August, but the fish that still spawn in those time frames, they're just not successfully spawning. They're still out there spawning, but those eggs aren't surviving. And it's just a really small window in the spring where, where it, it all aligns. Yeah. Um, what are Chromosomes. Chromosomes. Okay. That's good. Okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good, a good question. question. I know. And you're I'm going to test you tomorrow. Yeah. It kind of stumped me because I'm not a geneticist, which is funny. I, I now oversee a genetics lab. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. We won't tell them. <laughs> but but that's the key to management, right? You have good, smart people that work for you. <laughs> uh, chromosomes are are genetic makeup like our, what, what makes us who we are. Like you receive a chromosome from your mom and one from your dad, and then that's what makes you who you are. Well, and it's the same thing for the, from, for the sturgeon, but they get four chromosomes from their mom and four chromosomes for their dad, so they have eight. Whereas us and pr pretty much every other living species has two, sturgeon have eight. Thank you. Yeah, who else? We go up top here. Hi, Heather. I can yell. No, because then <laughs> the people at home can't hear you. <laughs> Are there natural predators in the Columbia uh, who, who do predate on, on these fish? Yeah, there is, and predation is a concern, not just for salmon, but uh, sturgeon as well. And there are avian predators which you would, is surprising because they're at the bottom of the river, but uh, cormorants could actually dive to about 80 feet. And um, in the, 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 our first hatchery release was done by Kritvik back in the, the mid 90s, and they released fish up near the, the town of Wenatchee in Rock Island Reservoir, and they released 10,000 fish. And then later that year when they were doing the pit tag detections on a, on a roosting, cormorant roosting site where they recover tags. 
there were literally thousands, about 2,000 um, sturgeon tags on that, on that roosting site. So. We're gonna have to do a cormorant sense of place now, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I saw one more, yeah, go for it. Go right into that mic. So how much uh, fishing for sturgeon is done in whatever it was, zone six between Bonneville Dam and uh, John Day? Do they still, is it still allowed to fish for sturgeon? And how many sturgeon in a season, would you say, do people actually pull out of the river? Yeah, there, there are still, um, there is still harvest below Bonneville and in the zone six area, but everything up above is just ca catch and release because those populations are so uh, nearly extirpated and they're managed by reservoir with the most fish being in Bonneville. I think there's a, in, I'm talking about like from tiny fish like this to adults, about 150,000 sturgeon in the Bonneville reservoir and then there's a slot limit that you're allowed to take, which is about four to, between four to six feet. So they're, um, and then they do stock assessments um, and then kind of determine what that population is in the slot limit and uh, extrapolate that to say like, okay, this year in this <laughs> reservoir, I think last year it was about 500 fish in total and that's between recreational and tribal harvest. So that's split in half, you know, and, um, but they also do year around, like you see the fishing guides out there. That's a big business for them because as she mentioned, it's the largest freshwater fish in North America. And so people do come from all over, like to go out and catch one of these monsters, river monsters, and then they, so they catch them and take pictures and, <laughs> um, okay, oh, 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 I see you up there. Hi there. I'm curious what place the sturgeon held in traditional practices on the Columbia River. Were they fished for? Was it with a net? Was it with a hook? Were they smoked like salmon are? Were they used for something besides food? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. And yes, they were harvested on the Columbia. Um, we, and people still, uh, nowadays it's, uh, there's a set line fishery and there's also a gill net fishery and some are captured on the platforms in the set bag nets. And um, traditionally they were harvested in that manner too, if you ever, and that's one thing I need to add to the presentation is the historic <laughs> photos where you see these large sturgeon that like we have that, uh, and then even non-tribal harvests where you see them using um, horses to, to drag the sturgeon out of the water. And um, in, in tribal culture, uh, they provided a food, a fresh food resource um, in the months when we didn't have the, the salmon runs. So in the winter, um, that's what got people through the winter because you, you look at that big of a fish, you could feed the whole village with that. And you know, they dry and preserve smoke um, salmon, but then, you know, like um, you, you want fresh, uh, fresh meat, fresh fish. And so that, that's what helped to sustain us in the winter months. All right, Miles, I've seen you. I saw you, you were patient and I appreciate that. Hi. things is that okay you just yeah okay, okay. stay focused here um, so my dad is a fish biologist right now he's on the east coast if he's watching this he's probably not but <laughs> if he was what would you say to him to a fish biologist <laughs> like some <laughs> advice you want Donella to give advice to your father I think that's okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not sure wh which fish your dad works with but I'm sure he understands that all fish are important, and I hope he realizes the Im important role that sturgeon play in, yeah, in the environment. And also, what is the absolute coolest thing you've ever done in your job? 
<laughs> oh, I like that question. <laughs> yeah, the, um, I think the coolest thing was when we were out doing the brood collection and catching those big fish, like that one in that picture, um, we um, caught it on a set line and that's a, just a small pyramid anchor, a 10 pound pyramid anchor with a section, a small section of rope and a hook. And the hook is literally this size, you know, it's a, and so we'd put a chunk of salmon on there. When we had that coming up, um, we knew it was big because we couldn't pull it up and you'd see big bubbles. I actually just said, tie it off. And <laughs> we let that fish drag our boat around in the water for, for about 20 minutes before it got tired and then we were able to land it. So, oh, good question, cool. Miles. Okay, I wanna do a couple more and then I wanna make sure everyone has time to see the juvenile sturgeon because Donella pointed out that no one ever gets to see them because they're at the bottom of the river. So the fact that you guys get to see them here is kind of a big deal. So if you have questions, let me go over the side. And then we'll come back to you kids. Let's do a couple more. Can you hand that back? Thank you. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, you spoke a lot about your heritage and how that influenced your yearn to work with these fish, but was there ever like a, an individual moment in your life like early on when you were like, I'm gonna become the sturgeon lady? <laughs> <laughs> what I would Thank do you. if I hadn't or if I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> if there was a time that I was regretting it, the, the fish are the easy part of the job. It's uh, the management side of dealing with people. That <laughs> that's difficult. <laughs> the people part is, is um, not, not always easy. And um, I think if I, w and it's funny, growing up, I wanted to be like a, anthropologist and things like that. So, and I think it's still really co closely related and I'm glad I had that interest, personal interest, which also factors in and is beneficial to the biology side. So I hope I answered your question. Okay, I wanna ask the last question for now, but we may, we may have time later, which is what are some of the things that you're doing to help the next generation of um, either Yakima Nation youth or other, you know, treaty tribe youth, how are you sharing what you're learning, both the Western side and also the cultural side with that next generation? Yeah, um, and it just outreach like this, because early on I was like, dove head first into getting this hatchery off the ground and up and running. And people would ask me like, no, I don't have time for that. I was so focused on doing the work, but after, you know, you know, getting settled and getting grounded and, you know, as I advanced in my career, it was like, okay, who do we have coming up behind? We need to, um, to share this information and this knowledge and uh, sparking that interest and in not just our, our tribal youth, but all youth. So that's why I'm really glad to, to see all these young people here today that we may have some future biologists here with us. And even if they choose not to, they still have, have that that understanding of the importance of the environment. And um, we do, um, like Lottie Sam here today, she's the education and outreach coordinator for the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program. And so that she goes and shares information and kind of tables events and uh, goes to schools and does pres presentations and things like that. And uh, Critvik, um, they host a salmon camp that's for the um, tribal youth and it rotates each of the four tribes host it each year, Yakma, Umatilla, it just it goes on a rotation and they get to have a, you know, a handful of youth, but like, like the, the work that you do, um, funding always seems to be the limitation and getting the capacity to even have people to seek the funding <laughs> it is, gets difficult. So that's what we've been really working towards, um, you know, awareness, providing opportunity, um, like internships um, and things like that when, when they're available. Okay, I wanna do one more question and then um, while she's asking, I also want you to be thinking about when people come up here and look, um, don't answer it right now, but when people come up here and look, what kind of things should they be especially noticing? And, and what are scoots? But hold on one sec. Okay, what's your question? Um, so, 
first of all, um, wait, do the fish live in the Col Colombia here? Do they live in the Colombia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. They live in the Colombia, and um, some of the fish that be live below Bonneville Dam also get to go to the ocean, and then they go along the ocean shore. They could go from California all the way to Alaska to feed, and then they come back to the Columbia. And originally, um, they, they used to be able to swim up the Columbia all the way into Canada, and then all the way into um, uh, eastern Idaho in the Snake River as well. Yeah, and also, what's the longest um, of that kind of fish you can that we've caught um, actually for work we caught that fish that was about 12 feet but um, it was when I was a teenager I was fishing with my family near the Dalles and um, gill netting in the fall and we thought the, the net was hung up on a log and when we finally pulled it up it was a large sturgeon and we were in an 18 foot boat and it was like every bit as long as our boat oh we just goodness. had to go along and cut it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. okay so everyone um Donella was saying um Lottie and Ty both came from um Yakima to help bring the fish and make sure they're happy and add ice and the course and things to make sure they're the happy temperature so thank you guys for joining us tonight um is there any preference? I mean, should I just release them to come look? <laughs> yeah, uh, however you'd like to do it to we'll have gather. people come through. Okay. Um, some of the things that you look for when you could see when they swim up on the side is seeing their mouth and how um, there's no teeth. And then so they vacuum their food up. And look also looking at their eyes, they don't really see very well. Their eyes is just, uh, they just sit sense movement because there's no light down on, on the bottom of the river where they normally live so they're not sight feeders which is why they have these four barbels just under on the underneath and then that's a sensory organ where they could uh, pressure from other fish but also electrical currents they could sense those things and that's how they find prey and then she said what are scoots they have these um, these three rows of scoots, one is down their back, and then they, well, five, right? Uh, and then one on each side, and then on the bottom, um, they have rows of scoots as well. And they actually, they don't, they're a bony fish, but they in evolve to move the majority of their bones to the outside of their body for protection. And normally in the wild, see, this is when they're susceptible to predators, other fish, that could feed on them. Unfortunately, today, it's mostly non-native introduced species like walleye and smallmouth bass that feed on the juveniles. And so um, when they're little, those scoots are really sharp like razors. If you catch juveniles in the, in the nets, you know, they could cut up your gloves. But in the hatchery, they're in close quarters. And um, so these ones aren't sharp, but naturally they are. And um, so they don't, they don't have a backbone. It's a, a, just a spinal column because they've evolved all of their, their bones to the outside. They do have some rib bones, but they're not a, they don't have very many bones inside of their body. Okay, okay, before you get up, let me do my final thing just so we can um, wrap it up for everyone at home. Um, I want to, quickly thank Joe Garut. He's with Big Britches Productions. He does all the live stream. If you like theater, there are plays that are all through Big Britches, so go see him. Etta Souser, who I think went home to her children, but she's the one who you get to meet out front, you get emails from, and she helps do a lot of the stuff behind the scenes that I am not good at. Um, CCA, thank you for having us. Next month, we are gonna have Beaver Power. We are gonna learn how nature's little engineers are being looked to to help restore our watersheds. It is an amazing story with Jeanette Burkhart and Margaret Newman. Go online to find out more information, get your tickets. I have a feeling it's gonna be a popular one. 
And I'm going to thank you now because we're all going to be around you and I won't get to give you a big thank you and get applause for you later. Thank you so much for making the trip, for bringing the sturgeon, and for helping us understand a little bit more of this thing that's been such a big part of your life. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. And thanks to Kyle Ramey, the photographer who hates to have attention drawn to him. <laughs> but really, thank you, Donnell Miller. Thank you so much. Okay. And now you can come see the sturgeon. <laughs> okay. I will keep an eye on this stuff, and you can do. <laughs> 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 <laughs>